Now we will see the demonstration on Docker. We shall start with setting up the Docker engine on our host operating system. We shall see how to pull images from the Docker Hub repository and start containers from these pre-built images. We shall look at some aspects of Docker networking and we shall also see how to create Docker images for our own applications. With that, let's move on to the demo. We shall begin by installing the Docker engine on our host machine. We shall follow the official guide that is available on the documentation page. I shall use the apt package manager to install docker. For that I need to add these repositories to the sources. There are uh, multiple commands there. We'll copy all these commands and save them as a script file that uh, we will run later. We shall run the script. So that would be dot slash docker install dot sh. The repositories have been added there in the sources. Now we can uh, install Docker and the related components. Follow the second instruction. There are quite a few packages in there. We copy this command and paste it on our terminal. It will install all the required packages using the apt apt get. The installation has finished. The next step would be to verify our installation. We can do that by running uh, this simple uh, docker run command. So there's an image called hello world. We shall use that image to run a container and check whether the container is starting properly or not. Now we can see the message has been printed. This was uh, outputted by the container that ran. It says uh, that uh, the installation seems to work correctly. So with that, our installation of Docker is complete. Now after installation, we have to follow one more step. That is uh, to be able to manage Docker as a non-root user so that we don't have to write sudo in front of every docker command. So for that, all we need to do is add our user to the docker group. We will use this command user mod 
to add our user to the Docker group. User has been added to that group. We can check that using the groups command. We see that for user, the Docker group, it is a part of the Docker group now. So for these changes to take effect, the group membership, we have to reboot the system once. So let us reboot it once. The system has rebooted and now we are ready to use Docker. We shall pull an image from the Docker registry and then start a container from that image. For that purpose, we shall use the BusyBox image. BusyBox uh, is a tiny Linux environment for uh, embedded systems. It comes with some uh, utils and is often used in testing networks. The image itself is uh, quite small, as you can see around 5 MB. Now we will pull this image from the Docker Hub registry using the docker pull command. Copy this command and paste it on your terminal. It is going to pull this image from the Docker Hub registry. To check the images that are available uh, uh, locally on our system, we can use this command docker images. It is going to list all the images that are available here. We see two images, the busybox image that we just downloaded and the hello world image that we had downloaded earlier while installing docker. To check uh, running containers. We can use the container ls command. Currently no container is running. Now to check containers that are running, we can use the container ls. Additionally, we can put uh, the minus a argument to also list the stopped containers. We can see a container that is our hello world container that we had ran earlier to test the docker installation is being listed as a container that has stopped. We could remove this container. To remove the container simply use the container rm command and then either provide the id or the name of the container. We shall use this ID to remove the container. The container has been removed. We can check this using the ls-a command again. There are no containers running or stopped. So now what we want to do is create a new container from our uh, image that we just pulled, the busybox image. So for that, we can use the docker run command. We shall go back to this busybox page and use this command they have mentioned over here to run a container. Now docker run command uses a hyphen i argument that is the hyphen i flag for interactive and t is for a pseudo terminal the rm the rm argument is indicates that uh, docker should uh, remove the container after it has stopped so it will not list in the stopped containers docker will immediately remove it when it is stopped additionally we can also provide a name for this container Otherwise, Docker is going to assign a random name. So let us name it as mybox1. Now we shall keep the RM argument as it is. 
and now we shall press enter. The container has started. As you can see, we are getting a shell here that is an interactive terminal. Now we can check uh, the running containers again. So let us uh, check the running containers. So we can see that uh, busy box, my box one, a container is running using this image with this container ID. Now we could uh, start another container. So I shall copy this command again. And we shall start uh, another container from the same image. I shall name it as my box two. Another container has been started. So let us check the ls. Now another alias for this full command is also docker ps. It is an alias for container ls. So it is showing us uh, two containers now. My box one and my box two, both of them are running. Now these containers, once they have stopped, or uh, if we exit from here, then they will be removed and any changes that we make to the container will not uh, last. However, we can uh, stop the containers. They can stay in a exited state, the stopped state. And if we start the containers again from the stop state, they will have all the changes. They will not be deleted. So let us uh, check that. Now these containers, if we exit from here, it is going to stop the container and remove it as well. We try to list the docker containers again, the running containers. There are no running containers. We can try to list the stopped containers. There are no stopped containers as well. Now uh, I will run the same containers again, but without, without the rm command. So remove this rm command. So now I am inside uh, my box one container. List the containers again to check that it is uh, up and running. So now what I want to do is let's say create a file here. Since uh, we are not uh, removing the container, we will stop the container and start it again to see that uh, the changes that we made in, inside the container would persist uh, across uh, these starts until unless the container is completely removed. So we see the file system here. We have uh, the usual file system. Let us cd in the home directory. There are no files here. So what I'm going to do is uh, create a new file. We'll create the same dummy file that we had created on the external disk. Sorry, I need to copy this command. Let us uh, copy this command for dummy file. And paste it inside this. So we see that uh, new file has been created inside the container. Now I'm going to stop this container using the exit command. Or we could even use the docker stop command. So let us uh, use docker stop command. It is trying to stop my box one now. It will exit from here automatically once it is stopped. Yes, the container now seems to be stopped. Let us try to list the containers. We can see that my box one is now exited. However, it is not removed. So if we start it again, then the file that we had created should still be in there. So let us uh, start this container again. So for that, what I'm going to use is the same command instead of run. I'm just going to say start.
we don't need to specify a new name since we are not starting a new container. So start uh, mybox1 with an uh, interactive terminal. We are in the container again. We can check that uh, whether the container is started or not using again the list command. We see it is up now. So now let us check whether uh, the file that we had created is still there in the home directory. Yes, the file is still there. That means the file was not deleted. It will be deleted once the container is deleted completely. So now we have seen uh, how to start and stop containers. There is another command called restart that will uh, stop and uh, start the container again. So we can try to use this command as well here. So that would be docker restart and then the container name of course. It will restart the container and uh, any changes there would be reflected. Until now we have seen how to manage container lifecycle using the run, start, stop and restart commands. Now we shall see how to attach storage to containers. There are two ways, either the bind mounts or volumes. Now as per docker documentation, they suggest that Volumes are preferred mechanism for persisting data generated by and used by docker containers. They have listed a bunch of advantages that volumes have over bind mounts. Bind mounts are uh, really just like a file or a directory on the host machine that is mounted into a container. It is uh, referenced by its absolute path on the host machine. So this is uh, really dependent on the host operating system and its uh, directory structure. We shall look at both these ways of uh, attaching storage to containers. We shall start with the bind mounts. To create a container with the bind mount, use the following command. Along with the docker run, we have to use uh, the mount option. So for uh, type, we have to specify bind and the source would indicate the source folder on the host device that we are trying to mount. I have selected her as the source. It is going to be mounted on the target folder that is inside the container. Now specify the image name as busybox. Container has started. Let us check the file system here. So ls command. I will cd into the home folder here. Now we check the files here again. So we can see all the files and folders that were inside the home folder of the host are now appearing here. There is the docker install sh as well that we had created. It is this folder that is mounted inside the container. Now we can also try to create a file from inside the container on this mount. So let us try to create a simple text file. The file has been created. We can check that from our host as well. We see the file appear here. Now we have seen bind mounts. Next we shall go for uh, volumes. So volumes are now, we, as we know, they are managed by Docker. So we have to first create a volume. So for that first list the volumes that they are currently there are no volumes. So let us create a new volume using the volume create then the name of the volume. We'll specify the name as dvol for docker volume. So new volume was created. We'll list the volumes again to see. The dvol is there. Now we can inspect the dvol to see more details. We see the mount point 
amount point key value pair there uh, it is indicating a, a path on our host file system now this is where the volume uh, is residing this is the docker area that we had seen earlier so docker has its own file system it it utilizes the host file system so this is the path where that volume is all the files inside that volumes should be inside that path on our host so let us try to access that path via the root user we'll cd into it and see there are no files that is expected because we just created the volume to run a container with this volume attached to it we shall uh, use the docker run command again now we shall use the mount option again but this time for the source we shall uh, supply the name of the volume instead of the path so the name of volume would be dvol the target would remain the same the container has started let us check the files cd into the home directory check the files here it is blank as expected now let us try to create new files here on the volume from inside the doc uh, container so i'll create the same file here a sample text file the new file was created inside the volume we could even check it from here from our host device we see that the new file is in fact appearing here and we are even able to read that file now we shall look at some aspects of docker networking very briefly as we have seen with word manager that a default network was created automatically that had a nat forwarding enabled it uses a vir br0 device on the host now docker also creates a default network just like that using its own bridge with nat forwarding enabled we can check that check the devices on our host now we see that uh, docker 0 a bridge device has been added uh, on the host it's just like the vir br1 device that was that we had created earlier uh, with word manager it's more like vir br0 with nat enabled so docker has its own uh, default network which is uh, on the device docker 0 by default now let us check the ip address on our hosts we see this uh, docker 0 bridge with an ip address assigned to it was created it is currently down but uh, it will get uh, it will be made up automatically by docker when any container starts so all the containers would connect to this uh, docker zero network by default now i will try to launch a docker container using the uh, the same busy box image the container has started let us check the ip address in here so it, it has its own ip address uh, dot 2 it uses that eth0 device to connect to that uh, docker bridge in fact let us see our uh, topology again for the network so now we see that docker bridge 0 has an ip address and the other container the busybox container with its own eth0 has its ip address and it is connecting to this bridge via this virtual port v v net port now this docker bridge has uh, uh, this nat enabled so that means the container should be able to talk to this outside world via this this wi-fi because this wi-fi is now connected to the internet and docker zero will use that nat so let us try to ping let's say the the google dns server which is at this ip address we 
we can see that uh, it is able to ping the Google DNS. That means it is able to access the internet. So in this way, uh, Docker Zero, the default network with NAT enabled forwarding, uh, enables this Docker containers to connect to the outside networks. So first let us try to start another Docker container. So I'll name it uh, MyBox2. Container has started. We see this IP address 3 has been assigned. So check the diagram again. This should be connected to the bridge, Docker 0 bridge by default. So it is connected to that bridge. So this bridge is, uh, you know, just like another bridge, just like the VR, VR, VIR, BR1 bridge. So that means we can also connect virtual machines to this. Now let us try to connect a virtual machine to this bridge and see whether that virtual machine is able to access internet via the NAT. So let us start uh, this Ubuntu 16 uh, virtual machine that we had created earlier. Check this IP address here. So we have one device except for the loopback that we had added. Uh, it is uh, it is being used to connect to the internet uh, network. Now that network doesn't have uh, doesn't have NAT forwarding, so we can't use that one to connect to the internet from the virtual machine. So what we can do is add another network card. So go to this uh, hardware information and then add a new new card here. Add hardware. So select the network. Now we need to add a new card, so we will select bridge device. We know the device, it's Docker 0. This card will now enable the VM to connect to this Docker 0 bridge. So we'll create this uh, network card. It's ready now, the link is up as well. So now we can check here again whether the devices are showing up or not. We see one more device, ENS10 has been added here on the virtual machine. Now this is a, our device that we just added. So to connect this to the Docker bridge, all we need to do is uh, assign an IP address to this and uh, make the link up. For that we need root access. So I'll use IP uh, A add. The IP address would be 172.17.1.0. Let us say assign uh, Assign some IP address to this, 101, 16-bit network ID and then device would be ENS10. We'll make the link up as well. So the link is up, IP address is there. That means it is connected uh, to the Docker bridge now. Let us try to ping the other container that is at, at an IP address of dot two. It is able to ping the other container. That means it's on the bridge now. Let us check our diagram again. Yes, now we see that uh, the two containers are connecting to this bridge where their eth zero and uh, the virtual machine is also connected to the bridge via this VNet. The VIRBR1 is also up. This is because our VM has another port that we had added earlier that is connecting to VIRBR1, the ENS3 interface. That is the interface being shown to connect it. So it's really the same VM that is connecting to both of these bridges. So now this means that it should be able to access internet here. Let us try to ping the Google DNS server. We see it's not reachable. Now that is because we didn't add a gateway here. There is no route. We need to define a route. We can check the routes via IP route command. We see that uh, this route exists there but uh, it is not able to reach internet via that. So if we check on our Docker container, we check the route here. 
okay we see the default route via the docker zero gateway the bridge is there so if uh, if the, if that is there on our virtual machine then it should be able to route through the gateway that is our uh, bridge zero docker zero so i am going to add that route here as well so ip route add default route via the docker zero gateway Check the routes again, the route is there, it has been added, so now it should be able to ping the Google DNS. Let us try to ping that server again. So yes, now it is able to ping that uh, DNS server. That means it is connected to the outside uh, internet via our wireless uh, device that is present on the host through the network translation that is provided by Docker Zero. So try to bring that Docker down. So we, we, we have brought down, down that uh, docker zero, now the ping has also stopped. So you can see it is not able to reach the internet. So it was accessing the internet via that bridge. So let us try to bring it up again and see whether uh, it resumes or not. The ping has resumed. So in this way, uh, any VM or Docker containers that is connected to the default bridge with NAT forwarding, they would be able to access the internet given that the default routes exist. These uh, settings are automatically done by Docker while creating containers. So we have seen that uh, how Docker creates its own network by default uh, using the device uh, Docker Zero, that is a bridge, and uh, all the containers that are started would be connected to this uh, docker zero bridge by default however docker also allows us to create uh, networks we could also create uh, networks that would be bridges and they would appear as bridge devices on the host so first we shall use this command docker network ls it will list all the network that are there so currently we see that there are three networks these networks were created by docker we have a bridge network, then there is a host network, and then there is a null network. These three networks would be created by default. We have seen how the bridge network works. The host network is uh, exposing the host, uh, host network layer directly to the Docker. We shall see an example of the host network. So for that, let us run a new container. I'm going to run the busybox container again. To specify the network that it has to connect to, we can use the network option. The network option, we have to supply a network name. So in that case, network name would be host. So the container has started. We see that these are the IP addresses. We can do the same command here to check. We see these five devices, the ENO0, this wireless device, VIRBR1 and Docker0 are appearing as they are inside the container. So there is no isolation now between the container and the host network. So this mode of networking is called host, host network in uh, Docker. So now let us try to use the other network type, which is the non-network. A non-network is like the container will not be connected to any network. So let us use this none. So we are inside the container. Check the IP addresses here. We see that the device itself is not appearing at all. So this container has no access to any network. Now let us uh, uh, check our Docker networks again. Docker network ls. 
So we have seen the host network, we have seen the non network, we had also seen the bridge network previously. Now we can also create our own network. It will be just like a bridge network. So let us try to create a network. So now we're using this command docker network create. I'm going to create a new network. The driver would uh, the the driver would be the bridge type driver as it was here. Then I have to provide a name. Let's call it dnet for docker net. So this will create a new network. So let us list the networks again. So our dnet is appearing here. Just like uh, the bridge default bridge network which was using docker zero device, docker zero bridge on the host. This dnet would also use uh, some kind of a bridge network or a bridge device. Let us let us check that on the host. We see that a new bridge is appearing. This is the new bridge that was created by docker when we created the new network dnet. Let us check the IP. We see that this new bridge is also appearing here. It has a new network, new network ID here. It is dot uh, 19. The default network was dot 17 here. So now this new network is isolated from this this original uh, Docker Zero network. And to connect uh, uh, containers to this network, we will have to specify the network uh, name while starting containers. So I will start another container here and with the network option I shall specify the name of the network which was dnet in our case. Let us check the IP now. Yes we have this uh, now under the 19 dot uh, 19 network. That is the network used by uh, this new bridge. Right, the 19 network. So it is now created to uh, connected to that. So let us check our diagram again. Yes, we see that the Docker bridge is down, the default bridge. Instead, the new bridge is now up, and the container is connecting to this bridge via this this V eighth port. So in this way, we can add as many networks we want. It will create a bridge for each of the networks of course when we specify the network type as bridge so now uh, we have seen how this works now this bridge is basically having a NAT enabled in it so this means uh, that the machine that we attach this DNET this should be able to ping the outside world that is internet let us check it is able to ping We could create other type of uh, networks as well using docker. Docker allows us to create multiple type of networks. These uh, details could be found in the official documentation here. One can refer this documentation for more details. Now we shall look at a quick example of containerizing our own application. We shall use the docker build command to create an image for our application. But for that we need a docker file. Docker file is a script that contains instructions on how to build an image. We have a sample web application, a very small application that has a front end web page interface and then uh, in the backend it uses a database. So all it does is uh, use the get and post request to read and write uh, to a table in the database. That table has two columns as you can see the UID and name. We shall use Cassandra as the database. Uh, Cassandra is available uh, as a docker image also. So we shall uh, use that docker image for Cassandra and to run containers 
So Cassandra would uh, be running as its own container. And then we will have our application running as another container, which will be talking to Cassandra's container to make the read and write into the database. So let's get started with that. Now we shall use Cassandra as our uh, database. So to run that Cassandra as a container, what we can do is pull this image first and then start a container. So I can pull this image here. However, I have that Cassandra image already uh, in I've, lo I've stored it locally. So Docker allows us to save images locally as well. For example, if I have if I list uh, the images available here, I see that I have two images on my system. Now I could save these images as a as a archive file. For example, using the save docker save command so we have to specify an output file name so that would be say for busy box i would say my box and then busy box the name of the image so if i save this it's going to create this uh, tar file my box tar so i have created it on my home folder as you can see this tar file is appearing here so I could import this star file uh, on some other machine. So like that I have uh, the Cassandra image available here with me. So what I'm going to do is import this uh, Cassandra.tar file into uh, my Docker images. So for that the command would be uh, docker load hyphen i. So we can see this uh, read from tar archive file instead of std in. So let us provide the file name. That file name is located at the following path. We shall copy this path. And cassandra.tar. So the image is being loaded now. The image is finished loading. Let us uh, list uh, list our images again. So we see the Cassandra image is now available. Now we shall use uh, this Cassandra image to start uh, database containers for our application. So let us first start the Cassandra uh, Docker container. So for that uh, we shall use uh, this run command again. So we can use this docker run command. We shall create a, a Cassandra uh, container with the name CASS CAS. We shall not expose the ports right now because the container uh, is only being accessed by our application container. It doesn't need to access the outside world. So I shall remove this and uh, we shall use the V option that is uh, volume. We shall bind a volume here. So for that, uh, we had already created a Docker volume uh, from previous session called a dvol. So I'm going to mount that dvol on the following location inside Cassandra. This is the location inside the Cassandra container where the where Cassandra stores all all its data. And then the image name is Cassandra. So with that. Uh, I shall run it and uh, since we are attaching a D volume all the data stored by this Cassandra container will persist on this volume so that means I can remove it when it stops so I shall specify the RM command as well now let us start this uh, database container the database container is up let us uh, list our running con containers So we see that the container is up now. So now that our container, Cassandra container is running, we can uh, enter into this uh, container and uh, create the appropriate uh, database that is required. So from our application, uh, we can see that uh, it is uh, connecting to a Cassandra cluster. 
it will automatically find any Cassandra clusters that are running on the network and then it will use simple insert commands and select commands according to the guest get and post request so it is expecting a key space called mydb that we need to create and it is also expecting a table my table so we need to create this table under the mydb key space let us create this uh, key space and uh, table so for that we can open a cqlsh shell from inside our Cassandra container. CQLSH is for Cassandra query language. It is similar to SQL. We are now inside the SQL shell. Now we need to create uh, the key space first. To create a key space, we shall use the following command create key space then the name of uh, the key space and uh, the replication strategy we will provide a simple strategy <coughs> now this is a single node cluster we don't need to worry about replication Now we shall create a table inside this key space. So we first need to use this key space. So use my DB. Now inside this key space, we shall now create a table. The table was uh, crea created inside uh, the MyDB key space. Now we can check that using the describe command. Describe and then my table. So we see this my table has a UID as an integer column with the primary key. Then we have the text the name column as a text. We can try to run a SQL command here as well. Let us try to run that. We see that our table has UID and name column, but there are no rows right now. So with that, our database is ready. Now we need the application to start accessing this database. So since the container is already running, all we need to do is containerize our application and launch it. However, since this container is using a persistent storage, we can exit, we can stop this container and we could launch a new one. It will uh, have this table already created, so we wouldn't have to repeat the steps. And this uh, table would be actually stored on the volume that we attached to this uh, container. That was our D wall. So with that, let us uh, stop this container. Let us exit out of this SQL shell. list our containers so it's a minus a so we need to stop this or we don't even need to use a container here stop would automatically mean containers so now provide the ID
the container has stopped. Now let us move on to creating a docker file for our application. So to create an image file for our application, we first need to start from a base image. Now since our application is a python based application, we would need a base python image. So what we are going to do is uh, use an existing python image. So I already have a, a python slim version here. So what I am going to do is import this into my docker. Like I had import the Cassandra image. So I shall use the command load docker images locally and I'll provide the path as python slim so it has loaded this image let us check our images so the python image is now also appearing here it has the following tag we will have to build from this image Now coming back to our application here, uh, we see that uh, it is uh, calling a cluster here, the Cassandra cluster. We need to provide a contact point for this Cassandra cluster. As you can see the first argument is the contact point. The contact points are uh, either IP addresses of the nodes where the cluster uh, is running uh, or an instance of a node is running, the Cassandra node or it might it might be host names as well so in docker when we create a custom network or a custom bridge like we did before if i do a network ls in docker we see that we had created a dnet that is uh, use the bridge driver now this dnet uh, is uh, isolated from other networks but it has a NAT, NAT translation, NAT forwarding as well. The containers attached to this network can refer to other containers attached to this network via their name. So whatever name we provide while starting the container that becomes like a host name for the container. It's a kind of a name, name resolving so by using the container name you can uh, address that uh, container and that's what uh, we can do here for the contact points we can simply provide the name of the cluster that is expected to be running I'm sorry the name of the container that is expected to be running uh, the Cassandra server or the Cassandra node so we shall start our Cassandra cluster or the Cassandra container with the name CAS the name of the container is CAS and this application will look for this uh, contact point when it starts. We will have to connect this application container to the same network. So now let us save these changes here and we also see that uh, the serve is being uh, sorry the app is being served on port number 80. Now this port number 80 is where our app is being served that has to be exposed to the outside network so that our app can be served outside the docker network maybe on the internet as well but Cassandra also uses some ports uh, the Cassandra ports doesn't have to be exposed because we don't want anybody accessing our Cassandra nodes via the outside network so the Cassandra container won't expose its um, ports. However, the app container would still be able to access because that would be an isolated network where only our app and the Cassandra container would be running. So with that, let us uh, create uh, one docker file for our application. Right. So. All we need to do is create a new file here, call it whatever we want. We shall simply call it docker file. So now 
we need to specify first the base image that we're going to build from in our case it would be the python image so for that we have to say from then we shall we shall check properly the name the repository is python so that would be python and then the tag so i'll select this tag and write it here like this so let me zoom in a little bit yeah so we this is our base image now we need to expose a port as we have seen here that our app is running on port 80 so we need to expose this port like this now next uh, we need to install the required packages now our app requires these packages flask waitress and cassandra driver so the python installation inside that must have this so for that we can simply run this command run and then provide the command so it is going to uh, do a pip install on the base image and it will install the required packages after that we will copy our application files that are required now we have a file called app.py we need to copy this this is our main application so simply say copy app.py now uh, one thing i forgot is to set the work directory work directory is the base directory from where our app will run so we shall create a new folder that is a new directory directly under the root this slash so slash app that is our working directory and we shall copy the app.py file from our host here to the inside the app folder so that would be app slash app.py right we copied our main file now we also need to copy some other files such as the templates that are being used by flask and the static files such as the the css files the templates have the html code there so the html and the css has to be included so i'm going to copy the static and templates folder as they are inside the app directory in the container so for that copy the directory static into app slash static and similarly copy the templates directory as well The required files are now copied inside the container. Now we need to provide a command to run. Now the command is a list of strings. Our command would be to simply launch, launch the application that app.py file. So we will give app.py. So simply python and then app.py. So with that this docker file is complete. Now uh, the docker file is now ready for our application we need to build this docker file we can do that using the build command and it will create an image so let us uh, use that command docker build now need to uh, specify the docker file here and uh, uh, the name the name of the image just copy this and we'll execute it inside uh, our v VS code so now we have this command docker build then uh, specifying the docker file here that we created and then the image file that is the minus t for tag and then taking the files from current directory so hit enter the image is being built 
it's running all the pip install all the drivers are being collected now this file is going to pack all these dependencies inside the image Right, the image is finished building. So we shall check that the image should appear here in our Docker images. Yes, we see that uh, our application image, that is my app, is now being displayed in our images. So it's there. Now, what we can do is try to launch this app, but we also require uh, a Cassandra database running. So what we need to do here is uh, start uh, start this Cassandra cluster first or a Cassandra database. So for that we shall use the run command again. So let me open it in a new terminal, a new tab. So we're going to start the Cassandra container again but we will name it as CAS because this is how our application is referring to the Cassandra database container. We shall connect it to our DNet network that provides the DNS uh, na name, naming uh, for our containers. We shall also attach this volume. This is where we had created the database and the table that is required for the application. So with that uh, let us start this uh, Cassandra container. Cassandra container has started. So let us uh, list Docker PS. So our Cassandra container is up. The name is CAS. Now we can start our application container as well. So I'm going to start the application container in the same way. We are going to specify the DNet network, the same network where our Cassandra cluster is. So our Cassandra container and the app container are running in an isolated network. Now on Cassandra we didn't expose any ports, but on our application we need to expose the port 80. So here I'm mapping port 8080 on the local host to this port 80 inside the container so that uh, the application is served on this port on my host. I'm going to name uh, this container as PY app. So let us start this container. Right, our container is up. Uh, both our uh, application and database containers are up. Let us check that with the Docker PS. Yes, we see our Pi app and our CAS are up. So we should be able to access the web application. So all we need to do is uh, go to port 8080. So that would be this address here. So we see that uh, our application is up. It's displaying the home page here. So we can do either get or post. So currently uh, there is uh, there are no records in our database so that's why it's uh, showing as empty. So we can also uh, go into our uh, database container and run a CQL SH there. To so let us let us do that now. So I will execute bash and then CQL SH in the CAS container. Yes, so we can use my DB key space. Yes, now we can uh, you know, just uh, select the star from the table that we had created, the app is using. So this was the table, there are no entries here. So what we can do is now try to post from here. Let's say ID number zero, name would be Alice post 
it had posted. Now if we do a get here, we see that uh, the UID is 0 and name Alice. It has read from the database and displayed it here. We can even check here again whether it has been created inside our SQL SH or not. Yes, we see that this uh, record was created. So this is a simple application that uses a web interface and uses get and post method to read and write data from a Cassandra database that is running on the other container. So with that, uh, let us uh, conclude this demo. Thank you.